Hello everyone, thanks Colin. Um, down there. Um, so my role here is uh, to feed back on what we found from the upcoming edition of the Urban Design Journal. Um, and this is quite an interesting topic, I think, for the Urban Design Journal and for urban designers in general, because uh, really it's bringing a subject which has an appeal that stretches far beyond urban design alone. And what we felt that this journal had was a great opportunity to widen the debate and to really get a chance to have voices from urban design, from economics, from politicians, um, and from a broad range of uh, stakeholders to find out whether or not the Garden City was a viable future for urban development. Um, so when we went out to people for the new edition, um, we asked a wide variety of people uh, and the response was really encouraging. Uh, so the edition contains contributions from Nick Falk and David Rudlin from Urbed for their winning entry at the Wolfson Prize, uh, from Andy Von Bradsky and Chris Wilford at PRP, who were runners-up in the Wolfson Prize, from David Locke, who was former government chief planning advisor, as I'm sure you will know, and founder of David Locke Associates, from Roberta Blackman Woods, uh, the Shadow Minister for Communities and Local Government, talking on the Labour perspective on uh, what Garden Cities can offer. From Katie Locke of the TCPA, from David Ames at the Lecture with Garden City Heritage Foundation, from France, uh, Emily Gerasso and Anka Dujouet from the IAU Ile de France, which is an institute for planning and urban development in Ile de France, and has been very crucial in um, uh, continuing that debate on garden cities in France. Uh, from Mike Devereux at the University of the West of England, uh, from Patricia Willoughby at Y Young and Partners from the CBRE, including Mars Gibson, who was the um, prize director of the Wilson Prize, and from Meta McClarney of Blue Pencil Designs, who uh, offers a really useful contribution on the role of developers and the relationship between developers and um, designers in garden cities. So essentially we have a broad ranging publication which really pushes out this debate across a wide spectrum. Uh, and what I wanted to do today is just skate over this, uh, bring out those themes which I think are really important from what's been brought out, those which can be um, pushed forwards and to help feed into this ongoing debate about what the relevance of garden cities is. Um, and the first lesson that I think is really important to take from this is that the garden city as Collins made clear is not a 21st century ideal it came out of a 19th century context and if we're going to make this work for the 21st century it has to be adapted to meet our modern needs um, so we should be doing this reflectively taking those elements that are relevant today and moving on from those which are more outdated and this means that even if we might associate the garden city with green fields and parks and low density living, in reality it's not about a particular aesthetic. Uh, and this is what we might assume it to be about, associated with arts and crafts, with a focus on landscape and certain architectural styles. Um, there's an association with the new urbanist movement and that aesthetic that goes along with Poundbury and other modern developments. Um, but this isn't the key point of the Garden City, even if there's value to be taken from that, and arguably there is, and I'll talk a bit about design quality and architecture later, I don't think this is the key point that we should be making. And our contributors throughout the journal repeatedly made the point, so it's really well known now, I think we're coming towards an understanding, at least in, some, at least in this circle, of what the crucial element of the Garden City is. And as David Locke said, the primary characteristic of a garden city is land ownership on the behalf of the local community, not arts and crafts architecture. And Miles Gibson and Liz Mason, CBRE, said it too, and they said the garden city is an economic concept, not a horticultural one. What we find is that the key point, as Colin pointed out, it's the capturing of land value and its retention for a community, which is key to remember. And this is what this diagram 
explains. And this is Ebenezer Howard's model for the economic and financial structure of the Garden City. It consists of a company who own the land and infrastructure in the Garden City. They collect rents from tenants, and those rents are fed back into physical and social infrastructure through a sinking fund. And you might not be able to see, but it feeds into an ongoing pension fund after upfront investment in infrastructure has gone on. It's a long-term model. It incorporates, as well as physical infrastructure, that ongoing sense of community and social infrastructure that's important in the long term. I'm not suggesting that this is necessarily the model that we should be using today. And again, this is a really important point that the context that Howard was writing is not the context we're writing in now. But essentially, this is what it boils down to. Um, and this was a utopian ideal at the time, but the reaction we got from the contributors is that even today it's not an impossible aim to get towards this kind of capturing of land value and retention of, of value is not unachievable. David Ames pointed out that in Letchworth and the Letchworth Heritage Foundation, they still remain responsible for the governance, for the reinvestment and for maintenance in Letchworth. Uh, in the model that Andy and Chris at PRP proposed at Stoke Harbour, the landowners who in their model are church commissioners would own the land on behalf of the community. Unlike in typical developments, therefore, the uplift in land value from the infrastructure would come to be captured by that community. And over time, they suggested that land values would increase by 15 times. In their model, it becomes retained on behalf of the community. Um, and then Nick Falk and David Rudlin from Urbed in their proposal suggested that there is potential for landowners to agree to invest part of their planning gain in infrastructure where development would otherwise be impossible. These are just some of the possible models by which you can capture uh, plan and gain. Um, and it is something which comes up repeatedly through the journal. I think it's so something very interesting about the practical approach that we can take towards getting towards this kind of model. Um, but getting the financial model right, I think, is really crucial in the Garden City because the Garden City, like, unlike a lot of other types of development, is very high risk. Um, this was a point that Miles Gibson and Liz Mason made. Um, the requirement in a garden city, if we interpret it as a standalone development, is to deliver a large amount of upfront infrastructure to unlock that development. It makes it very high risk for developers. Uh, but the delivery relies on low risk money from long term investors. Their argument is that urban development corporations have a role to play in this, but only if they have broad powers over land and infrastructure. And they also need to have reliable funding mechanisms over the long term to achieve this. And then there's the point that in Howard's time, these kind of issues of hope value and planning gain didn't really exist. What we're working in now is a much more complex policy landscape. Um, and I think in response to that, we need much more robust solutions in delivery uh, to be able to achieve these utopian aims. Um, so what we need now is political buy-in to achieve robust solutions. Um, and the political will is another theme that comes up repeatedly. Um, so Katie Locke from the TCPA brought this out, and the TCPA who were a very valuable lobby group in pushing forward how the future of garden cities uh, discussed this, and how the refinement of the Urban Development Corporation is a really key thing to be achieved through political will. Um, Roberta Blackman Woods, uh, as we'd hoped that she might have done, provided us, us with some positive sense of um, the future of the Garden City in politics. Um, and we know that Labour have been very proactive in discussing Garden Cities and housing through the Lions Review. But in general, while politicians are happy to talk about the potential of garden cities, there's a difficulty here where they're holding back on those commitments which will really make a difference. Um, and Nick Clegg, among others, has talked of locally-led garden cities. But we know that this won't work because local authorities are so unwilling to provide the numbers of homes that we do need in the places that need them. Um, Miles Gibson and Liz Mason point out this discord between housing need and individual motivation. And anti-development lobby groups complicate the picture when it comes to community buy-in. 
This means that we do need substantial buy-in from the public to overcome nimbyism to move towards any kind of fundamental change in how we can deliver garden cities or housing in general. That should go alongside meaningful public consultation. Um, and Pat Willoughby at Wai Yang um, emphasised this, saying, at the heart of any garden city should be an extensive, meaningful and collaborative community engagement strategy. So after all, if you have ownership for the community, as Howard's model would propose, it means the community need to be at the heart of whatever that um, design development process is. Um, so one of the great benefits of garden cities, which is particularly relevant for urban designers, is the potential that they can offer in terms of high quality design. Um, and you might say that high quality design is something we should be offering across the board, but perhaps there's something specific about the garden city which means we're uniquely available to offer high quality design. Um, in Howard's original garden city, he, despite the fact that we're arguing it might not have been the key point of the garden city, there's such an emphasis on design quality throughout uh, garden cities of tomorrow and also um, in how Letchworth was developed in the early part of the 20th century. So here we have Letchworth. Um, and there are crucial spatial elements of public parkland and boulevards and a need for varied architecture and design in the garden city, as he put it. Um, and so modern interpretations of the garden city do also emphasize the need for high quality design. Uh, and the contributions in the journal suggested that this is possible to achieve through certain elements of how we might adapt the, uh, the garden city. So PRP emphasised that public space and quality design can be an opportunity, not a burden, in the garden city. If you can put the ongoing maintenance of the garden city to a garden city company rather than the local authority, um, then pressures taken off the local authority, whereas they might elsewhere be unwilling to take on that. And a compact city and quality design can achieve better quality of life, better interaction, better integration, better health. Um, Pat Willoughby, in the proposal for Wai Yang and Partners, uh, sets out the four principles of garden cities as they interpret. And it's interesting that these are primarily um, uh, design principles. So, but that was the PRP entry, and this is uh, one of the illustrations from the Wai Yang um, submission to the Wolfson Prize and in this uh, edition of the journal. Um, and the four principles that she outlines are a walkable neighbourhood a strong town centre, a landscape framework, which is what this illustrates, and a permeable street network. Um, I think it says something quite important that these are principles, valuable principles, which we are associating with the Garden City. Uh, and Roberta Blackman Woods emphasised in her piece that the design review from CABE can really add value by bringing broad levels of experience and knowledge to the design process. Um, the idea that we should actively include all stakeholders, including local communities and different people involved in the design process to that, is, has a great potential for the Garden City, but currently the design review, they suggest, is struggling to do that. I think this is really key in the Garden City, which does incorporate such a broad spectrum of disciplines. Um, and capturing this vision at an early stage in the process is really key. So the other thing that Garden Cities can really offer us <coughs> is strategic development and the ability to master plan on a large scale. Uh, and the three articles in the journal which drew on specific design projects, and they were Urbed, PRP and Wai Yang, all emphasise the benefits of being able to master plan in the Garden City over, um, over that of stitching urban development into the city or that of unplanned sprawl. So by making a commitment to a new development in the Garden City 
through whatever governance or financial mechanism that might be, enables us to take a long-term view and therefore put those design principles that we think are most important into the master plan at an early stage. Um, and David Locke made the point that master planning at this scale also enables us to take, rather than a very detailed approach to master planning, a more light touch approach, a framework based on movement corridors and a green frame around which flexible design codes can be applied, enabling long-term build out and a phase development. Um, but one of the really key issues for building standalone cities and when we're talking about garden cities is that infrastructure is expensive. Building onto existing infrastructure is lower risk. It's also better from an economic perspective to be building new, to be building garden cities near where we need them rather than in standalone areas in non-specific parts of the country. And it's notable that when we talk about the garden city, we rarely talk about place in it. What the Wilson Prize did in many of its submissions was put place onto the garden city. And it's interesting that so many of the submissions chose a place and a context in which to understand and illustrate their proposal rather than talking in general terms, as I think is a danger of the debate more generally. Um, and the issue with that is that the housing crisis isn't the same across the UK. We don't need garden cities in the northeast. We need them in our least affordable cities, our most successful cities, like in Oxford and London and Cambridge and Brighton. And in Oxford, where house prices are 16 times average incomes, there's such a crucial need to be delivering housing. And garden cities potentially can be a really key way of delivering this. And this was the particular focus of Nick Falk and David Rudlin's submission. Their plan for Ooster, as this illustrates, was to build urban extensions onto existing cities. Um, and this illustrates how a Howard-style model of garden city and satellite cities could be fit into that specific context of Oxford. What this means is that we need to look at the green belt. And it's an issue I don't want to get into too deeply because it's a huge issue that we could talk for days about. But I think it's really relevant to this garden city issue. If we're talking about garden cities, we need to be talking about place. If we're talking about place, we need to be talking about how to enable that and what are those specific 21st century elements which are holding us back? In Nick and David's submission, they suggested that we need to be taking a confident bite out of the green belt rather than nibbling at the edges. Um, and the result of this type of approach, to take a strategic approach, could be that we can use something like a garden city, whether that's an urban extension, whether it's a standalone city, to achieve um, the housing delivery that we need and to reap the benefits that have been brought out elsewhere in the addition. And the fact is that if we built on just 5% of the green belt within the existing built up area, that's not even extending beyond the built up area of our 10 least affordable cities, there's room for 1.4 million new homes. This is the kind of debate that the garden city debate needs to be feeding into. It's part and parcel of the same thing. And I just want to end on four points as key issues which I think were brought out throughout the issue, throughout the edition. Um, and some of those things that I think as urban designers we should be pushing forwards and which should be a key part of the debate going on. And the first is that we shouldn't be seeing the interest in garden cities as a backward step for urban design. Even if we look at the type of design that's going on in Ebbsfleet and in Vista and feel nervous about what it might look like, actually there's an opportunity here for growing engagement from people outside the built environment, from people outside urban design. And to get that political buy-in, if we can achieve that from a garden city perspective, then there's a lot to be gained. 
to measure the strength of urban design, that so many of the finalists were urban designers, but also that they were engaging into a debate that's more than just design. I think pushing forwards on a more interdisciplinary approach to garden cities can help urban design more generally. Um, third point, until we have those planning tools that enable us to capture land value and retain it for the community, then garden cities will remain just a badge rather than ideal. And finally, the garden cities aren't the only tool in the toolbox. We need to be thinking long-term and openly about all of the different opportunities that we have for delivering housing and quality urban design, and that extends beyond just the garden city. Thank you. <laughs>